So I've often thought, I spent a lot of time thinking about Hitler, and I was thinking, well, how do you get into a state like that, you know? And you think, well, he's a dictator and he led his people down a bad path. It's like, that's not right, that is not what happened. They had a conspiracy together and went down a bad path. Now, think about it this way. <clears throat> if one person thinks of something about you, it's like, whatever, right? But if five people tell you that, well, what? Then, then to, start, to start not taking that seriously is kind of narcissistic, right? And if it isn't five, let's say it's 15 people tell you the same thing or act the same way towards you. It's like, probably you should clue in. Well, what if you're a politician <clears throat> and you're trying out a bunch of different ideas and uh, you're good at interacting with the crowd, you're charismatic, you watch the crowd, but you're not necessarily all that articulate, you don't have your values all straight now, but you're kind of angry too. And maybe that's because you spent a bunch of time in World, one in, War one, World War I in the trenches, which was like no joke, and all your friends got blown up. You, and then you were unemployed, and then you tried to be an artist, and that didn't work out, even though you were moderately talented. And then maybe the economy fell apart completely on you, hyperinflation. And then maybe there was a communist menace coming in from the East, and there genuinely was. And so, you're not the world's happiest clam at that point. And you're talking to people who aren't that happy either, because they were also badly defeated in World War I, and then they had a terrible treaty they had decided, and they lost part of their territory. And so, the crowd's not happy, and neither are you, and there's reason for it. And so you start talking to them, you don't know what you're upset about, and neither does the crowd. So you start to articulate some things about why you might be upset. And some of them fall flat, but you're paying attention to the crowd. So you stop saying those things. And some of the things make the crowd really wake up and listen. And so you start saying more of those things, right? It's un it's, it's an unconscious dialectic between you and the crowd. It's mediated by consciousness, but it's not like you're sitting there saying, although you might be, I'm going to tell this crowd more what it wants to hear. It's more sophisticated than that. And so you do that a thousand times, and you do that to ever-increasing crowds. And the crowd really starts to go mad. And they basically tell you that you're the savior of the nation. It's like, at what? how many bloody people have to tell you that before you start to believe it? You know, I would say with a typical person, a hundred will do it. That'll, that'll get you going, man. If a hundred people tell you specifically why you're special, you're going to be thinking, even if you're kind of humble to begin with, you're going to be thinking, geez, there's got to be something to this, man. But if it's a million people and they're roaring their approval, well, and then when it's a whole nation, it's like, good luck withstanding that. There's just not a chance. How are you going to withstand that? Now, you could be like Gandhi, and you could have taken that into account beforehand, because he did. He read Tolstoy, by the way. He was a student of Tolstoy, and that's it's very interesting, because Tolstoy was the person who developed the techniques of nonviolence that Gandhi used. And Tolstoy was also a deeply religious writer, <clears throat> apart from his novels, um, which are not, I wouldn't say, really in the religious category, although they're profound. Um, <clears throat> Tolstoy stressed humility with nonviolence. He really stressed it, and that's what Gandhi took to heart. So he lived a very, 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 very simple, bare-bones, ascetic life. And that was to kind of see if he could keep his damn ego tamped down while the groundswell was building behind him. You know, and he dressed really simply, and he didn't own much, and he ate very simply, and he just tried to stay away from the whole materialistic success element that would be an element of what would turn him into an actor and also inflate his ego. And, you know, he seemed to do that pretty well. You know, he certainly, well, he led a nonviolent revolution that resulted in the, in the independence of India. It also produced a terrible civil war and the separate separation of the Muslim Indians from the Hindu Indians. And, but I don't think you can precisely lay that at the feet of Gandhi, right? But, but what I'm saying is that you have to be an extraordinary person, you have to be extraordinarily wise, and you have to take ridiculous precautions if you're going to put yourself in the public sphere like that and expose yourself to that kind of adulation without becoming a puppet of the crowd. And that's what happened to Hitler. I mean, it's not like he wasn't also a conscious manipulator and surrounded himself by people who were propagandists and all of that. So there was a conscious element, but you've got to think these things through and see how that dialectic develops, like, he learned how to appeal to the darkest fantasies of the crowd. 
He was really, really good at it. And that was a dialectic process, right? The crowd told him what they wanted to hear, and it's, the crowd's a mob at that point. So I don't have to take responsibility for the fact that I'm screaming my approval when I'm surrounded by a million people. So I can scream my approval for whatever I want, for whatever, whatever dark, revengeful fantasy might be playing out in my imagination, because I'm not going to be held accountable for it. One of the things I learned about societies like the Soviet Union, and, and this is true of all tyrannical societies, is that the idea that that's top down and that people are just following orders, they're good people but they're just following orders, it's like you can forget about that, so that's a stupid theory. When a society becomes tyrannical like that, the tyranny exists at every single level of the society. You ty tyrannize your own conscience, so let's say you're a true believer. You're a true believer in Marxist utopia, let's say, or national socialist the Third Reich that's going to last a thousand years and be racially pure. You really believe that. And that's supposed to be a perfect state. And that's already been delivered to you. And so what that means is that insofar as you're a true believer, your own suffering becomes heretical. Because to the degree that you're suffering, you're living proof of the fact that the system is not delivering what it promised to deliver. And so you have to suppress that. You have to become your own tyrant. You can't admit that anything's gone wrong, and of course you can't talk about it to your family because one out of three of them are government informers, just like one out of three of everyone. And you're certainly not going to mention it in the workplace because unless you're a devout Communist Party member, you're not going anywhere. And if any of your ancestors were like landowners or, or bourgeoisie, it's like you're done, you're done. Class guilt, man. You're not going anywhere. And then every single level of the bureaucracy is exactly the same as that, and on the top there's a tyrant. But the tyrant is everywhere, everywhere, from the peak to the soul. It's all tyranny. And everyone participates in that by lying about everything. 